welcome to Altmark 80, the Altmark incident. And this is the 11th of February. If I have done all my organizing right on tweet deck and everything else. Now, longer a term, later in the month, probably about the 23rd, a very, very large, long YouTube video will appear, which will have everything from the events, all the videos that I'll make combined. But I thought as we were going along, we'd make it sort of like Singtel 80 was, and we'd have little videos coming up each day. So this is where we're going to start. Now, you'll notice for the background, I have chosen a pic of the outmark in Yossingford. This inside Norway. And that's an important thing I want you to think about when we're talking about this. A lot of the events take place in Norwegian waters, in Norwegian territorial waters, in Norwegian internal waters, in Norway, a neutral power. And just in case some people are like the GCC class I was teaching the other day, yes, World War II did involve Norway. Yes, the war went there. Yes, they were invaded. Yes, there was a whole recovery later on in the war. And there was all sort of battles in the beginning of the war over there. Norway was part of World War II. This was a very young GCC class, so, you know, it can skip past them. But the Art Mark was an event which was incredibly culturally and politically important at the time it happened. But honestly, most of the students I talk to these days don't really know about it at all. Even if they do know its name, they don't know what happened. But that is one of the reasons why I'm starting off the videos with some background. And the first thing I'm going to do is give you a background on the cruise of the Grass Bay. The Grass Bay is not involved in Norway at the end of the Altmark incident at all. But it is incredibly important at the beginning because the Altmark is the supply ship, the ship which has enabled all of this. Without the Altmark, the Grass Bay would have run out of fuel, would have run out of food, would have run out of everything quite a lot earlier. The, grass, uh, the Altmark was critical. She stored the prisoners for the Grass Bay. She was the at sea replenishment and repair hub. Everything that the Grass Bay achieved was thanks to the Altmark. Trump is the grass bay goes and gets herself sunk. Well, she sinks herself technically, but let's be honest, she gets sunk by the diplomatic battle that takes place in Montevideo. And if anyone wants to go and see more about this, there are lots and lots of videos under the title of River Plate 80 on the YouTube channel. Please do go look at them. I hope they explain my point. But I mean, it's one reason because I've done all those videos and I've done all the articles. I don't want to get into this in too much detail. But I do want to talk about the Altmark's involvement. The Altmark critically resupplies the grass bay here, here, many times during her cruise. They exchange prisoners, they move officers and men around. But the Altmark is not designed for these things. The Altmark is a merchant ship which was actually carrying on her normal merchant ship duties and merchant ship business. She doesn't really have a specialist crew aboard or anything. In fact, it's only when she meets up with the Graf Spey on the way down to the South Atlantic that she actually gets some naval personnel and some weapons put aboard her. So, Whilst all this is going on, whilst the grass are doing this, the Royal Navy are actually hunting the Altmark. Believe it or not, they are quite quick to work out that this panzer sheath, this heavy cruiser, some of you still like to call her a pocket battleship, but really she's a surface radar and heavy cruiser, this ship cannot be operating down here alone. She has to have a supply ship. So the Royal Navy are stunting, hunting the supply ship from pretty early on. And she has to get home from here back to Germany because the same factors which make her essential to the Graf Spey 
are the same factors which mean she has no sucker in this area either. She has no sustain. So the Grass Bay has achieved a few victories she has achieved. She achieved the political greatness and the, the impact and all those things that she has achieved. But she has ultimately had to scuffle herself in order to avoid being interned or destroyed by the British. This is a loss of faith. This is a loss of morale. However, there is a small kernel of hope. Small bit of joy that the Nazi party Germany could dangle onto. Look at them. That was the outmark. Because the outmark is like with nearly 300 prisoners. And if the outmark manages to get home, they can parade these 300 prisoners through the streets of Germany. They can go, look at us. We have kicked the British Empire. We have beaten the British Navy. We have smashed the Merchant Marine. Yes, we all know in actual reality, losing 300 seamen, whilst they would be sorely missing the Battle Atlantic, would not be a terminal blow for the British Merchant Marine. And all the other things going on. But look at it from a propaganda perspective. That's what the Cruise of the Grass Bay was all about after all. It was all about propaganda. If it was really surface raiding, it would have been hitting harder in that area, harder in that area, and harder in that area. Instead, it dilly dallies around, causing maximum psychological propaganda effect. It doesn't really do as much killing as it needs to do to have a significant impact. That is what those merchant seamen are wanted for. The psychological impact of their imagery appearing around the world, being paraded through German towns and cities. The prisoners of war. That is what they wanted. And by goodness me, if some of them had converted and started serving in the German Navy or something like that, it would have been never ending the joy that the Nazi party could have got out of it for their propaganda machine. So that's what's going on here. So, so we've looked at the equation going on on the other side, the grass bay and its impact on what the Almighty's trying to do. What is the Royal Navy response? Well, technically, it doesn't leave port till the 14th of February. But I'm discussing it today because, frankly, it needs to be discussed, and I want to discuss something else on 14 February. So, please, give me a boo. The force that goes to sea, HMS Cossa, HMS Mary, HMS Sikh, HMS Nubian. Four tribal class destroyers. HMS Intrepid and HMS Ivanhoe, two I-class destroyers, quite new vessels still, and fitted as mine layers, very useful systems. And HMS Arafusia, an Arafusia class light cruiser. Seven vessels, okay? Four of them, your most powerful class of destroyers available in terms of fighting power. Two precious mine, uh, mine layers, which you need for other operations, but which are very good if you need to get uh, do things to trap ship, a merchant ship. And a light cruiser, which isn't the command vessel for this operation. No, that's one of the tribal destroyers. This is a bar support vessel for this operation. Seven vessels for a patrol which normally has three destroyers. Sometimes a few more, but normally isn't quite this massive. Seven vessels going out, uh, theoretically according to what this patrols normally say to them, to hunt iron ore ships coming down from Norway to Germany. That is, merchant ships with no weapons aboard and a small crew chugging along slowly. And not only do they have this, they are further reinforced because 
of an influenza outbreak which has affected some of the crews, they've received further personnel from HMS Aurora, one of Arafusa's sisters, to fill out their ranks and provide boarding passes. That's a lot of firepower. That's a lot of personnel. That's a major commitment if you are just going after all ships. Now, if you remember what I said in the earlier videos about the psychology, about the problem if the Nazis had got those same, those prisoners of war back to Germany. Well, the Royal Navy wasn't stupid, neither was the British government. They knew the same equations. They knew they were facing the outmark at this point, thanks to various intercepts, but also, of course, some of the sailors who had been put ashore in Montevideo by the Grass Bay when she'd gone into neutral harbour had passed on information as well. They knew what her probable speed of advance by a circuitous route was. They had a rough idea of her timings. They were out there scouring the ocean for her. Any snippets, any piece of information provided by fair means or foul, they were going for. As such, that force starts to make sense. That force is pretty powerful. And it would work too. So that we have to think about what is going through the Royal Navy, the British government's mindset. They are sending quite a significant force out to sea. Theoretically, on paper, it is listed out for normal reasons, but as we've been over, it's unusually large for those normal reasons. So it suggests at least someone, when they're putting foot the force together, has an inkling. Plus, there is an interesting choice of command. The command of the force is not the guy sitting in charge of a cruiser. He's the flotilla, flotilla leader of the destroyer flotilla, which is providing most of the ships. And You'd think, naturally, it would be the cruiser captain. After all, that's the most powerful sister ship in the force. That's the theoretically the command vessel in the force. If you've ever seen some of stuff about tribal class destroyers, you'll know that there was a big dispute when they were on whether they could be used as flotilla leaders, as force leaders for destroyers, and whether it was better to have a light cruiser for the rear admiral destroyers. Theoretically, the Royal Navy sided on the cruisers. But this, the command is on the destroyers. More about that tomorrow. So, yesterday we discussed about command, and today's the 12th of February. Well, today is Captain Philip Vian, and I have some words I want to put up behind me. While discussing. Hopefully it works. When war broke out in 1939, Captain Vian, as he then was, ranked among the handful of officers of the armed forces who were trained, equipped, and of appropriate seniority experience to make it obvious that if the struggle were to be protracted, it would be upon them that tactical success would depend. That sounds amazing. Captain Vian had in his career managed to damage ships critically on not one but two occasions. Captain Vian is aggressive to the core. Captain Vian is probably one of the most hardcore Royal Navy officers you are ever going to read about, and please do go read about him. Because he's also one of the most thoughtful, one of the most thinking officers that ever served in the Royal Navy. Yes, he's aggressive. He will later on in the war charge across the Atlantic, leaving a convoy behind with no orders to engage the Bismarck. Why? Because he's not going to let her get away. 
because he's fairly sure that if he follows the Nelsonian maxim of getting his ships as close to the enemy as possible, the Admiralty will not hold against him. And they suddenly don't. They promote him. In Norway, he is at the front of all the operations, but all of that is to come. To, this is the operation which is going to make his name in the public. And he'll be aboard HMS Cossack, which is not actually his command ship. His command ship was HMS Afridi. Okay? The amount of times I read and people write Cossack was his flagship. No. Afridi was his flotilla leading flagship. Afridi had to go into harbour to have some maintenance done in the yard. And he decided Commander Sherborne, who was Cossack's captain, was frankly overworked, underpaid and tired. So he sent him off. To have a break and he transferred his staff over to the Cossack. Cossack was his second ship. She was critical, she was important, but she wasn't his normal flagship. Now I've got that out of the way. This actually is a picture of being on Cossacks. Bridge. Just, you know, it's one of those pictures which I have to say when I look at I go, wow. Because you can just see everything you need to see there. He's staring out, he's on the bridge, there is a very nice Lewis gun next to him. He's on duty. And he would spend quite a lot of his time on bridge here in Mexico. He was known to be aggressive, he was known as a very good destroyer commander. He was picked out because of it. Several times he managed to avoid going to staff college and other things because he is a good, aggressive destroyer commander. That has got him into trouble in the past. But he's managed to escape through it because he's also personal, intelligent, I mentioned that already, and is a reliable officer if you have a problem. Plus, he's incredibly good at motivating his crews. He's the second flotilla commander for his flotilla of tribals and he steps into what in his words were an excellently primed flotilla yet he still manages to get even more out of them. He does this in many ways by personal leadership. He doesn't expect anything from anyone that he wouldn't do for himself. The tr only problem with him is he expects quite a lot from himself which means he expects a lot from people. This can cause occasional issues, but overall he seems to do quite well. All right. On from, uh, on from the, uh, VM, who's next? Another picture of VM. That's the more sort of traditional naval steely eye pose. But if you look closely, you'll see there's a, and I can't believe I'm using this phrase, but I'm using this phrase because it's actually someone else wrote from a kindness in his eyes. He was very kind to his crews. If you had trouble at home, if you had an issue and being heard about it, it would be sorted. If you needed leave, he once managed to, <coughs> to get a young petty seaman, petty officer, home to his wife because she was giving birth and they just got in the harbour. So the news came through that she was going to uh, have the baby and all this sort of thing. To get him home, he gave him a letter for the Admiralty and said it had to be hand-delivered and it had to be done securely. So the, senior, the petty officer had to take it himself by train down to London. The actual letter, I've forgotten what it was about. I, am not, I seem to remember it being a story, it was a request for more ammunition or something silly like that. I'm not, not silly in all time, but it was something which could have gone by regular means. But he used the excuse to get this young, off, uh, this young petty officer down to his wife to see his new home. He thought about it. 
And unsurprisingly, that means he gets the best out of this cruise. They really do push hard. That means he gets the best out of this cruise. They really do push hard. Now, this is the Royal Navy warship which I'll be talking about most in the upmarket stuff. This beautiful, exquisite piece of engineering is HMS Cossack, a tribal class destroyer. Sleek lines, she is, like most astronomic destroyers, described often as a greyhound of the sea. These, ah, they're bigger than a greyhound. A greyhound is a sleek, fast tool. These things are designed for fighting. These are more hunting than a greyhound. We would probably go Alsatian at this point, but my natural instinct is to go poodle. I have one, a big standard poodle. I, but my family have had them often over the years. They are lovely dogs. And I know just how intelligent they are, just how capable they are. Perhaps a border collie is what we'll settle on then, rather than a greyhound. Fast, intelligent, can do whatever needs to be done in the job. She has eight 4.7 inch guns in four double mounts. She has AA armor at the center. These aren't high angle weapons. Believe it or not, the Royal Navy did look at the study of a more general purpose weapon mounting for them. And they did consider having a four inch high angle multi-purpose gun rather than 4.7 inch. But when they were doing the pre-war studies, the Air Ministry files and reports on dive bombing, meant that the Royal Navy thought they would get more time and in the exercises and conditions they did, they thought they'd get more time than they actually did to engage with these aircraft. So at this point in the war, they still have these 4.7 inch guns. Later on in the war, they will get this mount X replaced with a four inch, double four inch high angle gun. And they will greatly increase the number of pom-poms and machine guns and everything else they have aboard them to give them more light firepower against a hangar aircraft. She has quadruple torpedoes in the middle. Uh, those are the things which uh, keep battleships and heavy cruisers and other things at bay because you get too close to those, they will hit and they will make a big hole in your hull which will let water in. And letting water in, like having your ship on fire, is what sinks your ship. You don't want that. She's highly maneuverable, very fast, very capable. She's a destroyer. She's not really a destroyer, though. This is where I get into trouble, but I'm writing a book about tribal battle and daring class destroyers, so bear with me here. The reason I'm writing a book about it is they are fighting destroyers. They are the destroyers with heavy gun arms. She, you notice, has a cruiser line in terms of the gun proportions. Usually, they don't, wouldn't have that gun, or they might not have that one. They would only have about one gun at the back, A, if they were like, uh, lucky. Often they were single mounts, these weapons, and they would have a second torpedo launcher, and there's another quadruple torpedoes. Uh, they would also be a lot lighter. The tribal class were 1,850 tons, theoretically, none of them were actually that weight. Um, destroyers were normally closer to 1,500. That was by treaty limitation. These are technically what are called destroyer leaders. Everyone else, when they build them, builds super destroyers. The Royal Navy builds what actually comes from a light cruiser design study. And that is what they're being used for in this role. Let's be honest, merchant interception and these sort of missions are cruiser roles. Not. Yes, 
the Harwich Force and other destroyers had been used to supplement things. But HMS Cossack and three of her sisters are not supplementing anything on this force. They are the force. And they make sense for what's going to go down. So, let's start off, and this is going to seem a bit of a strange random part in the movie, so it probably won't go in the movie, but it might go on Twitter. I need to apologise. I didn't complete the Artmark videos on time. I have a reason. I'm an early career researcher and I got offered a different role, and there's a reason I'm recording a video in a Premiere Inn. I had to go out and do some work. You know, it's it's one of those things about uh, people often don't think about early career researchers and that we tend to juggle quite a lot of different jobs. In my case, another job I juggle is Justin Craig, a lovely revision company I work for. I help run their revision centres. I'm a course director. I worked for them for 11 years as a history and politics A-level tutor and now course director, been that for a few years now, and it's fun. I've been running a centre up in London and a centre in Watford. Lots of kids to help with the air levels, lots of them to calm down because they're getting worried this time of year. It does put your own stresses in focus. But I have to take this job. I love it, but I have to take it. It pays about four times my daily salary at university. But point is up. My daily salary for the university I work for mainly is less than a quarter of what I work um, working for this company. Which has caused some interesting conversations with employer with colleagues who basically consider me a bit of a mercenary for going and working in the private sector. And I point out in the nicest way it's my private sector work which pays my research. It's my private sector work which allows me to run a car. It's my private sector work which allows me to do pretty much anything with my life other than subsistence living. And I'm not even sure the university wages would pay for that. But it's also the list of different private jobs and academic jobs which causes me to have other fun, you know. This is going to pay off an accountant who I had to hire to sort out a tax bill, which came from the tax man getting confused with the fact that I have about seven jobs and seven income streams, and then going, you must owe more tax. Actually, after sorting out the accountant, it was found out that the tax man owed me money. Yay! Unfortunately, the accountant bill is going to cost more than the money they, uh, they, that the HRMC owe me. Ooh. But it's still a lot less than the amount that HRMC were trying to demand off me. So, yay! But this is the problem. When you're a junior academic, you have no money behind you. You have no security in terms of a job. It's a 10-month contract. You have none of the things which are traditionally associated with academia. You're in a profession which is dominated, especially in terms of image, as being a very safe, very secure profession once you're in it. And actually, the beginning stages of it really aren't. Now, a lot of industries are like this. Please don't take some of me saying that academia is the only industry. And please don't take this to me saying that academia is bad. It's not bad, it's difficult. And most of life is difficult. I wish it was easier. Currently at the moment, I'm juggling all this work, finishing off my book, and doing all sorts of other things. So, something had to give. And I'm sorry, it had to be limited to videos. There just wasn't the hours in a day. That's the ultimate thing. That's the ultimate decision. You have to make a choice. Am I going to do the work I love and passionate about, or the one which pays the bills? Sometimes you have to go with the one that pays the bills.
And there's also this. I'm sorry again, I, I had a slight distraction from Valentine's Day. Um, I had work, but I also had my lovely girlfriend come pay me a visit in London, and we ended up on HMS Belfast at one point. And that's got to be a girlfriend you've got to love. The fact that she goes with, your na with her naval historian boyfriend to HMS Belfast for Valentine's Day. I'm not sure what I did to deserve her. Uh, no. She's cool. Anyway, getting on with the rest of this. Norwegian neutrality. Okay, so. Norwegian neutrality is a very different scenario than most of us would consider it. Norwegian neutrality wasn't born of some Switzerland's desire to be a shining beacon for the rest of the world, or American isolationist desire. Norwegian neutrality was born from the fact that they had significant internal factions which supported both potential sides in the conflict. And honestly, neither side was a good answer. The pro-German side well, knew that, honestly, that if they go for pro-Germany, then their merchant fleet, which was massive and colossal, would get annihilated by the Royal Navy, or rather, uh, quickly and rapidly taken in across the world and reflagged or captured by the Royal Navy. The pro-British side understood that Germany was very close and despite the naval power and naval might of the Royal Navy, the odds were Germany might be able to reach them and do damage and they didn't have the forces to protect themselves. So you have two sides, groups which support each other, uh, which have support these factions and they want to support the ones they, so they like, but which also realize that neither side and that section is really in a position to help them. Both have negatives. Now, you could say that the Allies could have forestall or despite landing a few brigades. Well, they were fighting in low country and no one wants to widen the war and no one wants to be the democracy which invades a neutral country. Uh, and I say this uh, with a straight face when I'm of course considering Iceland <laughs> and uh, the Faroe Islands and various other things which the British <laughs> did invade and take over just because they had to. Um, yes, so, okay, they didn't want to invade Norway unless they had to. Norway's not a good place to go fighting. And you have to remember the British and the, don't have a lot of Arctic warfare troops at this point. The French have some, but the Germans have far more. And one can honestly consider that possibly one of the biggest problems eventually for the invasion of the Soviet Union was that quite a lot of whatever cold weather gear they had in it, certainly wasn't enough even for the Norwegian operation, went to Norway. But pretty much you have neutrality in Norway born not of a desire to be neutral, but it is a realisation that being anything other than neutral is suicidal. The trouble is being neutral was suicidal as well. And that causes problems for them. So, the Voyager of the Altmark. Now, I did a video of this earlier today in the classroom, which I borrowed quickly. Your benefits of being a course director. Yeah, if there's a free, free classroom, you can quickly wander in there. And I did some drawing on the whiteboard, which was a very cool scenario. Nowhere else I go does it have that facility. So. I don't expect to see that anytime soon, but lovely facility. Anyway, so the Voyage of the Outmark. This is much what happened, of course, to the German merchant marine. Add about a z uh, times about 10 that number, and that would be what would have happened to the Norwegian merchant marine if they decided to pull it and decide to join the Germans willingly. 
And honestly, from a Battle of the Atlantic perspective, the Germans invading Norway was great for Britain because it added all these merchant ships to the ships which were prepared to go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards across the Atlantic to bring Britain supplies, to take supplies to Russia and the Arctic convoys when that time place. All this stuff is great that Norway and the invasion of Norway for them. As this is, it shows the sheer scale of the problem. The Almanac has a long, boring voyage. When I say long, boring, it manages to avoid contact, which is a good thing. But it's also complicated. They are a tanker. They are not a prison ship. They are not designed for long voyages. They're not even a big tanker. So they're doing all this, and really, they are not the ship for it. Not only that, but the scenario is complicated because they have the Merchant Marine crew aboard and a small, small naval crew. And there is pretty much tensions the whole time between the two groups. And then you have Captain Dow. It's not a Lansdorf. He's certainly not any of the officers at the River Plate on nowhere near a Vian. Um, but he's trying his best. He's not an inspirational character, but he's trying his best. And that's got to be considered. That can't be held against him. And he does a blooming good sailing job. Crappy personality, great sailor. Let's leave it at that. So, so now hopefully this trick works. It might not work. So, the 14th of February, the voyage of the art mark. Now this won't actually get out on the 14th of February because I'm actually recording much later, but this is the point I want to make about Captain Dow and his skill as a navigator, as an AWOS. This is the Royal Navy's effect in the South Atlantic. Last time we were looking at the Grass Phase kills and the Grass Phase victories. Well, frankly, the Royal Navy is being just as successful. They have a lot more assets down there for starters. They have a lot more infrastructure. Well, they actually have infrastructure. They are able to do all this, you know? They're getting all these ships. So it makes it difficult. And you have to remember, much of this point, much of this time while this is going on, the grass bait is operating down in this area. I know, I like this whiteboard. Quite cool. So, if this works, which it should do. Yeah, it's being nice. So, here is the map for anyone who's really looking at the real plate eating all these will be very familiar with this map it's the gordon smith command structure of the royal navy all the different commands and this is a rough route of how Altmark got up there now i have to admit i drew this in paint it's not that brilliant and honestly it was probably more sort of like that It was somewhere in the, sort of this area it went up. I, different sources are very sort of different on how they account for its movement, so it's an interesting scenario. But what is the point is, Outmark, Captain Dow manages to do this when the Royal Navy's already doing this. So 
The Royal Navy's already got a fairly successful net going on, even before they're trying to hunt the Altmark. And now they're trying to hunt the Altmark. They know she exists. They know there's a tanker. The moment that the grass bear rides in Montevideo, the moment that she has to let go of the British prisoners of war she already has on her border, and the moment they get to various embassy points and our debriefs, the Royal Navy is absolutely certain that A, their suspicion in terms of tanker supporting the Grass Bay are correct, and B, she's a prison ship. So they're after her. And yet, she does all this. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are going to go, but it's pre-satellite age, it's one ship in a vast ocean, they've got all these other commitments on, they're doing this. It's not easy to do this. It's not easy to navigate to avoid being seen to hide your identity. It is very difficult. Yes, even at this time. Grass Bay kept it up for a long time, but it got found out. The Altmark managed to keep it up for longer. And that was by no means a naval crew. They were merchant marine. The Altmark arrives. And I was going to do this slowly, but, you yeah. know. So, the Altmark arrives. It's spotted. So the torpedo boat sent out. And uh, frankly, um, Franz Munster is quite an important person here. Because somehow, somehow, he hasn't read his documents. He hasn't done what he's supposed to do as an officer. And he doesn't do the basic checks. You know. But, sorry, I'm going to stick my feet up. It's been a long day and I'm tired. Not because I'm being rude. So I do apologise if anyone's insulted. It's just me being lazy and well, I can't lie on my bed alone because that's where the camera's set up. So I'm having to use this a rather uncomfortable chair, I must say. Anyway, so, leaving that all to one side. He sends across his first officer, one person to conduct a survey on a ship that big. And honestly, he doesn't manage to see much. He gets the basic information. And Points when he could hear, points when he could sort of find out about the special cargo she's carrying. At those times, the Germans activate winches, they beat back rioters, they, using water hoses and improvised weapons, everything they have, they use. This makes it difficult. Now, here's in Bond Pass. That's him. Captain D.F. Harlock. It's a name like that. It sounds like he should be a pirate. Anyway, he is a bit of a pirate in some respects, but we won't get into that here. Um, a honourable, more a privateer than a pirate. An honourable gentleman. Um, He is an experienced merchant sailor, a exper very experienced captain. And he's suspicious. The moment he sees the outline, he is suspicious. There is this grey ship. It's a tanker. It's supposed to be coming back with fuel, and yet is riding as high as anything. It's got a lot of air in it. It's been out for a long time, and when he gets the information he gets from the pilot, Goes straight to the Royal Navy authorities, and they do know what he spotted. So at which point Hudson start getting dispatched, and VN gets a notice, and all sorts of things go into action. After all, this is Britain. They've known the outmark was coming ever since Montevideo. They they are getting spring into action now. So.
diplomacy. Now, I was thinking about putting all sorts of pictures and things and getting into this, but honestly, it's even more twisted than what happens in Montevideo. So it's far more simple to get into this. The British, before the art mark is even found, are sort of threatening the Norwegians, going, you can't let the ship through. The Germans are threatening them to let the ship through. Every time she gets stopped and inspected, Captain now gets more irate and sends off a message to the, em the nearest embassy to say, da 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 this. He then gets told off because he's not supposed to be sending off radio messages inside the Norwegian territorial waters. And before seeing that, I found a load of jamming equipment. Seems like an onerous task. Anyway, so it's a constant diplomatic battle. And the thing I wonder, and this is a point, of, a point to consider, is whether or not the diplomatic battle was not only giving the British time, which Captain Dow did realise, but by forcing him to communicate was actually revealing his position. Because he's stumbled across by a flight of Hudson's. And they go, he's here. And HMS Arafusia, a light cruiser, and her two little destroyers, Intrepid and Ivanhoe, go, hello, we'll go and investigate, because they're closer. Because Cossack and her tribals are further south. They're further south for a reason. They were expecting Almac to have got further along. Welcome to Yossingford. The critical area for what's to come. So, for those wondering, this is the bits of water which can be used by ships roughly and the rest of the stuff is mostly land brilliant drawing isn't it so as you can see here 500 meters Roughly that distance from there to there is the scale. So, at no point possibly there is the field more than 500 meters wide. And certainly Less than two and a half kilometers long by that scale. It's a narrow, narrow space. Especially here, here, and here. Now, actually, the incident where the Altmark tries to smash the Cossack will take place in this space. You would think it would take place in this space, but it really doesn't. Um, despite these being the narrow points, the art mark has taken itself quite safely in there. So it actually does the Cossack and Vienna a favour. Torpedo boats will position themselves out here. These are the little ends. Altmark uh, Let's see, let's put the nice little sort of funnel on the back oh, yeah. And the bridge Yeah, it's a nice of it And the Royal Navy Well again, think about it's measured in cannon shot, it's measured in miles territorial waters, and yet the Royal Navy 
will be mostly in this area. One, um, sort of up here, and on around there. Yes, they concentrate on the Cossack in this area actually, but remember it's Arafusa's group. Arafusia, Intrepid, and which fighter? The, the I-Class vessels. And it's the I-Class vessels which first chase the Altmar into Yosinfor. But they're driven off by the Norwegian torpedo boats because the Royal Navy doesn't want to actually pick a fight with Norway. They want to win, they just don't want to declare a war with Norwegian in Norway yet. And so this is where it becomes the scene of the contest. What's really interesting is that at several points, Cossack is estimating and the VM is estimating that Arif uses um, significant electronic warfare capability is managing to block the Altmark from transmitting messages. Yet the Altmark is actually managing to transmit messages. And it's probably due to the fact that there are significant Mount, well, let's be honest, call they are. Rocky outcrops bordering on mountains all around this area. It's not exactly a nice flat land. So there's a lot of protection. Just when going into Yossingford and uh, being chased by the two destroyers, the pilots, the Norwegian pilots, don't even know whether it's deep enough for the other. So they actually hail a young boy, 16 year old boy who's cleaning his boat, and go, is it safe? Is it deep enough? It really is a last throw of the dice. Interesting enough, whilst Dow will place a lot of faith in these keeping this out, the German security, uh, the German Navy, the German intelligence understand what the criteria is going on here. They understand that whilst those 300 prisoners are not really worth much in the grand scheme of things in terms of their actual skill level, they are critical, they'd be useful for the uh, Bad Atlantic, but losing them is not going to be a war winning, uh, war losing blow to the British Merchant Marine. However, it could well be a devastating blow to the psychology and the politics of the situation. And that is what their value is. But the trouble is now, rather like the Monteverde or the Almark score. Unlike the other, unlike the Grass Bay and Monteverde, though, there is help not far away. The Germans do consider. Can they send a cruiser? Can they send a battleship? Can they send a force of destroyers up to break the Altmark out? The trouble is it would take a lot of effort to do all these, and the Low Countries was the priority. So the Navy had suffered. And it would be nice to sort of think that you could surge ships, but it's actually, even in wartime, it's difficult to surge ships when you're already overcommitted. If you do not have slack in the system, you cannot sit them out to surge. So, for modern discussions, when we're talking about the sufficient numbers of vessels, everyone always looks at the current number of taskings and go, right, we have these taskings, so therefore we need this many vessels. What you need to do is go, we have these taskings, we need therefore need these this many vessels, but we also need a small amount for contingencies, for surges, for emergencies. And therefore you work through them and you go, yes, we need them. So, for example, if you have six vessels to deal with the current roles you have, you need, uh, having a seventh is a surge capability. So let's say you need a fleet of at least 18 escorts to carry out the current operations. Then you might well want to consider 21 to 24 a viable number because that gives you a surge capability for dealing with the contingencies, and it's contingencies which always do come up. Right. Next, on to the more interesting things. Uh, 
Ah, you're sinking forward. Now, again, I'll have done a look at this earlier with my big board. But have a look at it here. And not just the very fine picture up there of me on a kayak in the sea. But have a look at this and the colours. That is some mountainous waterlogged terrain. That is really weird, but really normal for Norway. And that's where the art mark is going to get caught. So, the action itself is an interesting occasion because what happens is you get the borders going across. Now, there's a debate as to whether or not they were using cutlasses and whether they swing across, and in the nicest way we all imagine. That it's sort of like Johnny Depp, and they're going, yeah! And yes, to an extent, they probably are. And there are accounts where they're not using catalysts. Um, to my mind, a sword is very much part of a naval officer's uniform. Ceremonial might be more these days, but in those periods it was still considered quite a practical tool. I cannot imagine young officers, especially young officers from cruisers, where the sword is even more important than on a destroyer, because after all, cruisers do imperial policing, cruisers do all those sorts of operations where actually a sword and the ceremony of leading the guard and all these things becomes far more important and daily part of life and more likely to carry have swords and well a naval officer has to have their own sword um makes it all more likely they were used so my thinking is this i think probably the boarding party from the cruiser aboard did use it i wouldn't be surprised if the officers from there did use it but I would all think that the second wave, or more supplements from the destroyers, were unlikely to. Because the destroyer men were more likely to go for the pistols. And honestly, knuckle dusters, knowing most destroyer officers I met of that period, and especially destroyer petty officers of that period, um, I can certainly imagine would have been more keen on the idea of knuckle dusters for close in fighting than a sword which they would probably considered very foolish in tight confined spaces. But a cruiser officer, especially an officer who served in the Far East or the South, Atlanta, South America or many of the cruiser stations would definitely consider a sword a good weapon. So I think both sides are right. I think there probably was one or two swords involved but I think when there are reports that, oh, the Cossacks who went across, I didn't see a single sword amongst them, were probably also right. I think it's the cruiser boarding parties. So they get aboard the ship. And it's always fun. You get aboard the ship, you're boarding it. And the first boarding, there doesn't appear to be much fighting. Yes, there are reports of a few shots fired, and no one's quite sure who fired first. There are lots of German accounts claiming that it couldn't have been them because the guns were an issue, but in a nicest way, you had a fractured and divided command structure, so I um, wouldn't be surprised if the guns didn't matter if they were issued or not, they'd still might well have been used. What you do have is a lot of people who are on two sides of, com of the conflict with weapons in close proximity. The odds are someone's going to start shooting. The German crew mostly run off onto the ice in that direction. In this painting you do see them holding guns and all sorts of things, but uh, you know. 
that may or not be, may or may not be the case. The Navy dashes downstairs to free the sailors, shouting out the Navy's here. We'll get onto that later. There is a tussle for control of the bridge. Uh, disputes over whether it's Captain Dow or another officer who keeps playing with the regulator control to try and make the ship go faster or slower, but they get removed from it. When some German crew do, do decide to try and retake their ship, that's when the British turn actually their own machine guns on them. And it's one of those scenarios, it's a bitty, nasty fight. There's no not going to be. There isn't a single shipboarding in history which has been clean and neat. You're invading from your home to another person's home. And as we all know, when it comes to fighting for our home, we get very territorial humans. They didn't take the ship. They didn't take the crew prisoner. Now, why? My theory is it's deference to Norwegian neutrality. It's a sop. We don't need to. We're taking the prisoners home. We are saving them. We don't need to take you guys prisoner as well. In fact, far better for you to go back to Germany in ignominy. Limp home. They don't, but that's the story for another day. Alright, so, HMS Cossack. Grandest little ships of the King's Navy. Uh, rather rhymes quite nicely, but you can clearly see her outlines as a fight and destroyer here. You can see the firepower she has mounted forward, and her lines. She's a destroyer, but in cruiser form. It was perfect for the role. No hyperball going on at all in this one. A German tanker commanded by Captain Dorn who by all accounts is one of the nastiest Nazis who ever sailed the seas. Please don't. <coughs> I hadn't talked to anyone at this point. It's entirely making it up, okay? They haven't asked if Captain Dale was one of the nastiest guys who's ever sailed the seas or anything like that. They are literally doing hyperwall, but this becomes set in imagination. As I've already been over, this was a part of the propaganda war, but the point is, Altmark wasn't really as nasty as it could have been. They could have made it a lot worse, but they wanted to get the prisoners back alive because they were far more valuable alive. So they were giving them as much food as they were giving their own crew. She wasn't designed as a prison ship, and it wasn't going to be particularly nice, but it wasn't, let's put it this way, he wasn't setting out to be purposely cruel. And yes, he was a Nazi. Was he the nastiest Nazi or most evil Nazi who ever sailed the seas? Let's be honest, probably not. There were a lot worse. And that's not always a good thing to say, but you know, it's trying to correct this. I'm not saying he's a good guy, but trying to correct this. After discovery of the old mark by the RAF, 
British warships pursued her until she took refuge in a Norwegian field. Forget Captain Haldeman. Passing that mentioned that during the pursuit, the German tanker Velder was hailed by the British that she had gone scuttled herself. Where were we? Go it. We left the old park in the fjord with the British outside. When night had fallen, came a straight from the shoulder order from the Admiralty, go in and get our men. HMS Cossack went in. In the glare of the searchlights, a crew boarded the old mark under fire from the Nazis. And go... Okay. A. Eh? Not under fire. At no point were they under fire during the boarding. They had the searchlights on, and there was some fighting once they were aboard, but while they were boarding, no. Once they were aboard, there was fighting. And notice what they're not mentioning? The Norwegian torpedo boats. No point of them mentioning them. Up to the 300 odd starved and ill treated Britishers imprisoned below deck, the release they hardly dared hope for. See, they're starved and all these things, and then you see them walking. Somebody like this. in the old well, well, fed, but you know. men had 11 weeks of it. Listen to John Quigley of the SS Torella. What do you think of it all, Mr. Quigley? I'm very glad to be home again. With the hell of a time aboard the Art Mark. Thank you to our Navy for taking you home again. We appear to have upset Germany pretty badly over this affair, and in a lesser degree, Norway. But we'll leave that to the competent authorities to deal with. Meantime, Britannia still in Lovely. So we've upset Germany a lot, and to a lesser extent, Norway. This is what the reality of this operation is. It does upset Norwegians, because at one point they're talking with the British Rear Admiral in Norway, who's one of the naval attaches, and they're basically going, oh, we're going to deal with this internally, we're going to go search the old mark, we'll deal with it, you just have to hold off. We're not quite sure whether his response reaches the Admiralty, and they decide to ignore it, or it reaches it and they have no faith in it, or it doesn't reach the Admiralty in time. Whatever happens, the Royal Navy does this anyway. It's fun times. So if we return to this, this is of course the picture, the Saviour's Return. It is a tremendous thing for Britain. It's a, a victory in the phony war, another one, you know, we've had the River Plate and now we have the Altmark. We've got the plucky Navy fighting again, we've got the navies here, which spawns a book, a song and all sorts of things. It's a brilliant, brilliant propaganda victory. It turns what could have been a propaganda loss into a propaganda victory. It's great. Not so great if you're Norwegian or German, but it's great. Legality. Consequences and legacy. Well, these are the consequences and legacy. just a one real news item. This was going to be multiple reels. This was going to be non-stop non -stop fun for Britain, and that is what it produced. The hell ship Oldmark lies in a Norwegian field. No more, we hope, will she serve as an aid to Nazi frightfulness. For her present situation, she has to thank the vigilance of the Royal Air Force and the determination of the British Navy. Again, ignoring the Norwegian torpedo boat sitting here, right? Britain just wasn't standing for the further ill treatment of British seamen. The story of Old Mark's dash into the fjord with British warships on the tail and of HMS Cossack's magnificent rescue have already been told. So we'll leave the Old Mark with... Let's go back to a nice picture. 
and leave it there. So, this is a few of them. Listen to it. This is where the old mark ends up. Literally just the sort of the entrance for, uh, sort of towards the end. If we go back to an earlier picture, which I well, there's a few old, you can see where she ends up if you look at the map carefully. There you go. You're looking at it and she ends up in this sort of area. It's not a fun scenario, but what is the legacy? What are the, com uh, the problems that come from it? <sighs> Operation Lobo? Well, that was coming anyway. In the nicest way, that was a natural promulgation of what Nazi Germany was already doing. So, invasion of Norway was not started by Alt Markinson, although it certainly provided a nice Kaiserspelli to talk about. What it did do, and interesting enough, is secure an idea in the minds of the British public of raiding and of the British government of raiding as a concept to return to. If you consider World War I, raiding hadn't really been a major feature. And if we consider Napoleon Wars and the traditional British way of war, raiding was a, a, a feature, if there is such a thing as a traditional British way of war, which is a whole different debate to get into. It works. And it's an operation which therefore has an impact because of that. It's a legacy because of its success, and it has an impact in many areas of operation. One of the most interesting one of those legacies is that uh, <laughs> the Quislings, the uh, lovely people who run Norway on behalf of the Germans and Nazi occupiers, um, they try to use Yossing as a way to denigrate those people who support the Allies and the Norwegian government exile. Uh, and actually it becomes a badge of honour, so much so that it gets banned before the end of the war. It's a little incident with a lot of impact. For Norway, its legacy is that being neutral isn't necessarily the same as being secure. And that perhaps explains their relationship with NATO and membership and all the other things they've done since World War Two to, to provide themselves with security. The Saviour's return now, I will have looked at the video with you. It's worthwhile considering how important this was from the emotional perspective of the British public at the time. The phony war wasn't active. The phony war was a lot of build-up, a lot of stress in the gut, and a lot of heartache of separation, but not a lot of action to stop you thinking and worrying up here. It's just a constant fear ball of this and this, without anything coming in that you can hold on to. The Battle of the River Plate was something you could hold on to. The Altmark incident is something you can hold on to. It's tangible results. It's tangible successes. Which makes you have to rethink the value of these early naval confrontations in World War II. Because you can't just rate them just on their pure military successes their value as war fighting successes, but also their value as hearts and minds operations of the British public.
and for that they are excellent. Now, the legality of the version we first did. Let's put it this way. Both the British and the Germans were illegal. It is not illegal to take prisoners of war through neutral territory at this period. It's iffy, but it's not illegal. What is illegal is if you drop your anchor and you anchor and you keep them on. As long as you're moving, you're okay. But the moment you're anchored in the internal waters, you should disembark them. You should admit you're carrying them. All sorts of things which the Almark doesn't do. <laughs> but there is still no legal excuse or justification those worries for what the world may be. There is still no legal justification or excuse for what the Royal Navy did. It's a moral justification. It's a military justification. It is not a legal one. In fact, what they do is highly illegal. So, both sides massively in the wrong. We know the consequences. There were many. So, this video will air on a Sunday. I will be hopefully at home with that wonderful creature sitting on my lap and having a rest and getting on with some writing. Yes, that's my puppy. Okay, he's not really a puppy, he's two years old, but he'll always be a puppy to me. He is gorgeous. All right. Thank you for listening. I hope I haven't gone on too long. I've got to edit these videos together now before I go to bed tonight. Why do I set myself these tasks? Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the art mark incident. There will be a paper about it at some point, but at the moment I'm rewriting for the sixth time the section in chapter three which covers it. So, you know, perhaps you can give me a boon and wait for the book. And again, sorry. I made a promise to deliver this all on time and I had to let you down. I don't like doing that. Have a good night and thank you.